Welcome to three true creepy FB marketplace horror stories for us die. Twos, a chilling journey into the dark side of online transactions. Dive into three real life tales of unnerving encounters, sinister sellers, and haunting purchases made through Facebook marketplace. Each story unfolds a new layer of dread. Warning of the unexpected horrors that lurk within seemingly innocent deals. Prepare yourself for an eerie exploration of the true terrors that can emerge from the shadows of the digital world. Hey there, guys. We did it. I just wanted to say a massive thank you for being absolute legends. We've officially hit 10,000 subscribers. Your support, comments, and all-around good vibes make this channel what it is. Whether you've been here from the beginning or just joined the party, your presence is what keeps the stories coming. Here's to each and every one of you for being a part of this fantastic journey. Let's keep the momentum going and hope 2024 brings even more goodness to us all because we're just getting started. Once again, thank you so much. So, I've been browsing Marketplace for weeks, trying to find a cheap, used car since my old beater finally crapped out for good. With my tight budget, I knew I couldn't be too picky, but still wanted something reasonably reliable for my commute across town. Gotta have those wheels to earn the paychecks, you know? Anyway, one night, I came across a listing for a Robin Egg Blue 2001 Honda Civic being sold by some random middle-aged dude named Steve. The car looked okay enough in the photos he posted, with typical wear and tear on the exterior, but the interior looked clean. The mileage wasn't too crazy for the year at 150k, and Steve said it ran great with just minor cosmetic damage on the front bumper. Oh, and get this, he was only asking 800 bucks. Seemed like a freaking steal of a deal for a running Civic, right? I messaged Steve through Marketplace, and he seemed normal enough at first. He said he was just trying to quickly get rid of the old setting because his wife desperately wanted a bigger SUV for their road trips with the kids. He came across as friendly and eager to make a sale, even offering to personally deliver the car right to my apartment so I could give it a test drive first. Sweet deal. I started dreaming about smoothly cruising around town for work, errands, and weekend trips in my roomy new used ride. Heck, my mechanic buddy could easily replace a dented bumper if this Civic truly drove as nicely as Steve claimed. On the scheduled morning, I waited with nervous excitement, peering out the window down at the street. Right on time, a truck hauling the Robin Egg Blue 2001 Civic pulls up outside my building. This middle-aged, bald guy sporting an Indian's ball cap pops out, waving and announcing himself as the infamous Steve. We make some awkward small talk about the unseasonably warm weather as he unloads the old Honda from its trailer. Bending down to inspect my potential new wheels up close, I notice some definite wear and tear the photos didn't show. Chipped and faded robin egg paint, a sizable mysterious stain on the upholstery, and ceiling fabric dangling down in a sagging, worn driver's seat. This jalopy might need more TLC than I thought. I wanted to impress dates with my whip, but when Steve turns the key, after some sputtering, Miraculously, the engine revs to life on cue. Okay, the nearly 20-year-old car runs, at least, even if it sounds like a wheezing animal clearing its throat. After letting it idle for a few minutes, Steve reminds me the gas tank is topped off and pushes over the keys so I can take her for a spin myself. Go ahead, take it around the neighborhood a bit, just to get a feel for how she handles he encourages confidently. Grinning at that 
new car smell, which is more like a musty old man and couch smell. I adjust the dismal seat and slowly ease the junky Civic onto the side street, heading towards the main road near my complex. At first, the test drive goes fine enough as I put her along the empty back streets. The engine makes some concerning sputter sounds when accelerating, but the brakes seem to mostly work, minus some squealing. I manage to get the crackly AM oldie station going for some extra ambience too. As I approach the stop sign, getting ready to loop back home, I figure, what the hell? Let's see what this beater's really got. The coast looks clear both ways, so I slam my foot on the gas to see how this baby performs at higher speeds. Well, that was a big freaking mistake, my friend, because mere seconds into aggressively speeding up, I hear an ominous pop and bang from the front right wheel well. Before I can even react, the tire goes bouncing straight off into the grass, and the entire car starts violently grinding metal on asphalt. I'm struggling to control the wheelless rogue vehicle, now just skidding along the brake rotor while shooting sparks everywhere like some hellish fireworks show. Things go into horrifying slow motion as I'm white-knuckling the wheel, yelling, oh crap, watching us skid directly toward a huge, sturdy oak tree on the corner. Despite my panic stomping on non-existent brakes, there's no stopping this imminent disaster. Now, the deafening squeal of metal and shattering glass fills my ears as the airbags explode with a bone-jarring impact, violently whipping my head back and blasting my face with powder. I'm totally stunned for who knows how long. Ears ringing, clinging to the deflating airbag, covered in mysterious powdery residue mixed with a freakish oozy liquid from the back seat stain now soaking through my nice work slacks. So beyond traumatizing, trying to gather my dizzy thoughts, I slowly stumble out through the busted window on shaky legs to assess the true damage once my brain stops rattling. Um, yeah, going to definitely give this roadside death trap a hard pass. Steve, my man, the former front end, is now completely wrapped around the thick oak tree, spewing up smoke from somewhere. Three of its four wheels are completely MIA, except for the lone rear tire still chilling nearby on the grass. I see various busted car parts and debris scattered down the block that apparently broke off during that hellish, fiery skid show before the devastating impact. Absolute insanity, with car shrapnel everywhere. As if all that wasn't horrifying enough, shady seller Steve is nowhere to be found when the cops finally roll up with a tow truck. Dude definitely heard my crash landing all the way down the road and just straight up abandoned the accident scene without even making sure I survived the impact. Probably took off running to peddle more dangerous clunkers to other unsuspecting victims trolling marketplace. So skeevy and negligent, I tell you. I'm still randomly finding tiny shards of glass poking out of my hair weeks after that near-death crash test gone grisly wrong. Obviously, I never heard a single peep from Steve the seller again after he left me for dead, come to find out from the cops that the Death Trap Civic was actually registered under some known local scammer named Pete Davis. So. Steve was just an alias he used while trying to offload the ticking time bomb vehicle onto unsuspecting buyers. Super sketchy situation for all parties involved. But bro, have some common human decency to at least pretend to care 
if your marketplace customers survive your faulty products. Peace and safety to all from this bruised litter crash test survivor. Okay, I really need to vent about the single creepiest Facebook. Marketplace encounter of my life. I still get panic attacks remembering that whole demonic laptop fiasco. So my trusty old HP laptop finally kicked the bucket out of the blue last month. I'm talking. It wouldn't turn on or even boot up, no matter what troubleshooting tricks I tried. Blank screen of death, rip old pal. We had some good memories. Now, being a broke college student, I obviously didn't have hundreds of bucks lying around for a shiny new replacement, as nice as that would be. But I desperately needed a working computer for writing papers, doing research, basically all my homework. These gen ed credits don't complete themselves, you know. After hours of obsessively digging through marketplace listings, I came across a posting for a used Lenovo laptop, only a couple of years old, being sold by this random local seller named Wade. The photos in Wade's listing showed a few light surface scratches on the keyboard and some fingerprint smudges on the screen. But otherwise, it seemed like a capable machine that would handle my basic school Netflix needs. And at $225, it was just within my budget limitations. Seemed almost too good to be true, finding such a recent model so cheap. I eagerly messaged Wade, asking if the Lenovo was still available. He wrote back promptly, saying indeed it was, and he could even swing by that very evening to check it out if interested. Sweet deal, right? My spidey senses were admittedly tingling slightly, interacting with this complete marketplace stranger named Wade. But I brushed it off. Assuming he was likely just another introverted gamer dude trying to offload old equipment for cash. No biggie. As directed by my GPS map tab, I nervously pull up outside Wade's rundown little white bungalow around 8 p.m. that night. Even in the darkness, I can't help but notice his overgrown yard full of weeds and knee-high grass. Several of the exterior window screens appear ripped and dangling loose, and the whole place just gives off a creepy, abandoned vibe. But I've steeled myself down. Assuming Wade probably just spends most of his non-working hours gaming inside with blackout curtains. No judgments here. I hesitantly make my way up the front walkway and knock on the weathered door. After a few beats, it creaks open, and I'm greeted by who I assume is Wade himself. He's a tall, lanky dude, sporting stained gray sweats and blinking, carefully in my passenger seat. Boom, baby, still got it. Safely back in my bedroom that night, I eagerly fire up my discounted laptop for the first time. The fan whirs to life, and the glowing Lenovo logo pops up right on cue. Hey, all right, Wade came through with the goods. As I'm exploring the window settings and installed programs, suddenly, a suspicious folder icon shows up on the desktop that makes my blood turn to ice. Wade's secret stash. Wait, what? I thought creepy Wade said he wiped this thing clean. What the hell could be in here? With building panic, I reluctantly open the ominously named folder behind the innocuous pixels. I'm immediately bombarded by the most twisted collection of video files that can only be described as deeply criminal and sadistic. I won't describe the specific imagery and acts shown, but let's just say there were traumatizing scenes of women being stalked through dark woods, several tied up in a basement as this Wade dude circled them, leering with weapons, shallow graves being dug, and the most twisted of all, lengthy assaults, where the victims are forced to perform horrific acts before their end 
by an unseen man behind the camera. Beyond just creepy fetish content, I've now thrown the laptop halfway across my bedspread, having a full-blown panic attack. Oh my God. I just paid this guy who was clearly an actual violent criminal and deranged man. Those poor women must be real-life victims, not actors. Which means I'm now an accessory to his deeply evil criminal trophies. In a frantic mania, I dig out my external drive and spend nearly an hour overwriting the laptop to scrub and permanently destroy every single trace of Wade's sinister presence. Once fully erased and restored, I carefully reconnect the laptop just to be 1,000% sure it's now clean. Phew, nothing but the normal Lenovo desktop restored. No more folders full of bound, gagged women and damning accessories. After thoroughly sanitizing my shaking hands, I finally muster the courage to call the police department's non-emergency number to report the unwinding discovery of these soul-scarring videos. But apparently, Wade is a known creep who always slithers away right before cops make it inside with a warrant. So for now, I'm laying low, far away from that monster's tales of horrors where any another poor soul doesn't fall into his trap. I still have nightmares imagining Wade torturing, posting more bait laptops to fund his real-life saw collection. But lesson learned, if something seems off with the seller, abort mission, and definitely poke around people's creepy digital files before handing over any money. Who knows what demons lurk on those hard drives? So unbelievably skeevy and traumatic, I desperately need some hardcore therapy and eye bleach now. Okay, I have to share probably the creepiest Facebook marketplace-related disaster that's ever happened to me. It still makes my skin crawl. Remembering the whole bloody antique wardrobe fiasco from last month. I had recently moved into my very first solo apartment right after college graduation. The place itself was amazing. Definitely a step up from my cramped dorm room, but it was basically an empty space with barren walls at first. Being on an entry-level job budget, I couldn't exactly furnish it all at once. However, there was this huge, empty, built-in closet that I felt compelled to fill with something cool. Straight away, I really loved the look of those giant antique wardrobes with the elegant carved doors that open to reveal rows of clothing racks and shelves. Timeless stuff. But of course, items like quality solid wood armoires run for several hundred bucks at minimum, way outside my meager decor budget. Then, late one night, while I was scrolling aimlessly through Facebook Marketplace, I stumbled onto a listing for a vintage 1950s oak wood wardrobe priced at just $1.150. My eyes just about bulged out of my skull, seeing the beautifully carved doors and ornate, detailed trim in the photos. Sure, the piece looked a tad dinged up and worn from what was probably decades of use, but the important oak wood bones seem sturdy and sound in the pictures. Plus, the seller, a nice older lady named Miranda, had just written in her listing, posted only two hours before, that the wardrobe was freshly deep cleaned inside and out. Basically, the perfect budget fit to convert my sad closet into a walk-in storage paradise. Without hesitation, I excitedly messaged Miranda that I could come pick it up as soon as the very next day and would pay her full asking price with an unbelievable stroke of luck, or so I naively thought. Cue the horror movie sound effects, of course. Actually getting my giant antique wardrobe successfully hauled up three flights of stairs 
and maneuvered into my apartment ended up being an absolute beast of a task. My scrawny musician ex-boyfriend, who was supposed to help, flaked as usual. Luckily, at the last minute, my apartment building's maintenance dude, who was pretty burly, was willing to assist me with wrestling the massive furniture albatross. But even with two straining sets of adult muscles, it was a huge production just getting the thing through my doorway in one piece. After what felt like an hour of awkward lifting, re-angling, and breathlessly inching it around corners, we finally managed to barely cram the carved monstrosity into my waiting closet. After mopping the sweat off my beet red face and neck, I couldn't wait to get my overflowing piles of uncontainable clothes and miscellany neatly organized at last. Re-energized by the motivation sparked from achieving phase one of Operation Storage Tower, I decided to start transferring my chaos into my classy new centerpiece immediately. As I'm happily hanging dresses and arranging shelves of sweaters though, I slowly start noticing the center's scented wood grain actually feels damp and odd. Considering it was supposedly deep cleaned before delivery, puzzled, I lean closer toward the back panel and instantly recoil. I could clearly feel an obvious moistness seeping out from within the grain, heart suddenly racing. I cautiously run my fingertips along the rear grooves and bottom ridge. That's when my pulse literally explodes finding crusty, congealed drips of some viscous substance. Frantically, I grabbed my phone, turning on the flashlight with unsteady hands. But nothing could prepare me for the gruesome horror show illuminated down there inside my pristine antique. Because dragged across the floorboards were dark crimson smears and dingy handprints that could only be one thing. Blood and not just trace droplets. I'm talking partially oozing pools and drip lines that looked soaked into the oak grain days ago. The stark evidence of violence rendered me paralyzed for several seconds as my brain flickered to every true crime show episode ever about dismembered bodies being stuffed into wardrobes or cleanup attempts after gruesome murders. Wait, what the actual hell? Did Miranda knowingly pawn off this former grim corp storage locker onto an unsuspecting rookie homeowner? Pulse officially skyrocketed. I scrambled backward out of the closet and frantically dialed police with shaking, bloodless fingers to report my shelter room's wardrobe of death. The emergency operator tried calming my escalating hysteria enough to gather critical info about my address and situation. I desperately begged them again and again to rush to my location immediately for a first-hand look at the undeniable pools of blood evidence congealing inside my closet of doom. Surely the cops would find clues there to crack open whatever sick homicide case had played out and been conveniently concealed by Miss Miranda. But of course, by the time not one, but three irritated uniformed officers finally sauntered over in response to my breathless pleas, over 20 minutes later, and I shyly led them back to the open closet threshold. They just said it looked like paint and did nothing as if they'd never splattered those carved innards, leaving me looking like a babbling basket case, pointing dramatically into an utterly mundane furniture cavity, with confused cops smirking behind my back, making me realize one or more homicidal maniacs with my address were now roaming free out there, covered in corpse juice. And so the, the nightmare deepens, friends. 
I promptly tried desperately messaging Miranda, of course, with frantic accusations about her selling me a previous crime scene without proper sanitization disclosure, but quicker than you can say bloody fingerprints. Miranda had already changed her Facebook profile name, deleted our entire marketplace messenger thread, and blocked me on every channel possible to avoid culpability. So now, I'm utterly emotionally traumatized and financially screwed, being stuck with this $150 altar of Satan taking up my entire closet. Thanks for listening in. If you like these stories and want to hear more, then please subscribe and like and support this new channel. We have more stories for you to listen to.